At first light, the port of Koror on the main island is starting to come to life. For the team of scientists, the adventure is just beginning. Among the experts is Prithajit Shatrath. His job is to prepare and take casts of the delicate remains and run a laboratory which will be set up on the mainland. My role basically is but to get them fossils and cast them since we cannot take those fossils out from this country. If this is what they say they have found, it would be a great for the science. They're about to find out, but they'll have to hurry. The island is surrounded by a delicate coral reef, so it can only be approached during high tide. There it is! If they miss their window, they'll have to wait another 12 hours. Okay, we gotta be cautious from down here. Now, if I remember this correctly, this thing is just around that corner. Lee retraces his steps. The bones are just as he left them. There he is. Oh my goodness. It's all here. Now the real work is about to begin as he and his team set out to assess exactly what he's found here. There she is. <laughs> What's your guess on cranial capacity? The cave consists of a main floor, one that's partially covered by a collapsed roof. Back of this area is a tunnel leading to the cramped inner cave where Lee first found the pile of bones. Within minutes of entering the main cave, the team of scientists and researchers make a new discovery. More bones. Instead of the remains of just one body, there are many. Yellow flags are used to mark out and protect the delicate fossils. With so many bones being uncovered, eight days suddenly seems like a very short time. The spread of remains raises many questions. Could this be a mass grave? A killing field? As they start to try to piece together the bones, finding an easy answer looks like an impossible task. It's like a jigsaw puzzle that you sandpaper all the parts that fit together off. I'm just thinking how hard this is gonna be to sort out. <laughs> There's a tibial shaft, and you're left with, um, with this. I mean, it's fabulous. It's, it's, it's full of faults. And a closer look at these fossils suggests a bizarre looking people. The gap between the eyes is much wider than in modern humans. And there's that pronounced brow ridge, consistent with humans that existed over 10,000 years ago. And the bones are small, but that could mean they're from children. So are these ancient humans, or an indicator of a whole new species? To answer these questions, they will need to find out just how old these bones really are. Yeah, I'm excited. A lot's going to hinge on the age, so I can't wait till we get some dating done and really know what we're dealing with here. Lee calls in Rhonda Quinn an expert geologist based in the U.S. 
Carbon dating analyzes the breakdown of carbon in organic materials such as bones to estimate their age. One of Rhonda's tasks will be to collect samples from different layers of the cave floor that will be sent for carbon dating in Florida. This will help determine when these people lived and hopefully give some clues as to how they died. First, her challenge is to set up a laser grid that will create a 3D map of the site with coordinates for all the major finds. Isn't that fun? This virtual cave can then be analyzed to see how the remains may have shifted over time. And members of future expeditions will be able to recreate the cave just as it was first found. The trick is, is that you need to be able to come back and recreate that datum over and over again. As the team explores the inner cave, they find a second skull. We've got another individual, I think. It's more intact than the first one, but embedded deep into the solid floor. With most of the fragile fossil hidden, extracting it in one piece will be a long and delicate process. A jawbone nearby looks like it belongs to the same individual. This material, at least that skull, has not moved a very long way. That is, that that mandible, if that is her mandible, and I think there's the same wear state, everything looks right, um, was attached to that skull. A closer examination of the skull yields a surprise. What I've just discovered is this little piece of bone that's sitting right on this individual's forehead. Um, literally against it is in fact that of a neonate. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a child that may not even be born yet. The remains of part of the baby's upper jawbone, the maxilla, and some of the face are fused against the forehead of the adult skull. Could this be a mother who died in childbirth? The find, combined with the range of ages and sheer number of bones here, suggests this cave could have been home to an entire community. Those were real, live people, family, friends, cultures. Maybe it's the fact that there are so very, very many bodies here. I'm almost touched more than any other site I've ever worked at. Rectus, maybe 750 to 850 cubic centimeters. Measurements of the skulls show that whoever these people were, they weren't just small. They're some of the smallest humans ever found. Modern adult humans have an average height of around 1.7 meters. Based on the team's estimates, these people would have stood just over one meter tall, 1.2 at the most. That's roughly the height of a five-year-old child today and similar in size to our ancient ancestors. Early hominins such as the famous Lucy who lived over three million years ago were short. Okay, Lucy was less than three and a half feet tall. These bones don't appear to be quite that old but the small size does make it seem likely that they go back at least 10,000 years. If that's the case, there's a problem. Even with the movement of continents and changing sea levels, the islands of Palau have never been closer than 800 kilometers to the nearest major landmass. With evidence of ocean-going boats only going back 3,000 years, how could these cave people have made the epic journey to Palau? 